and thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about, not about how to hire employees in Berlin for C++ development, but I'm actually going to talk about range-based text formatting. So, um, well, text formatting is one of these things that everyone has done and it has been done a gazillion times and there are many different libraries and approaches and everyone does it a bit differently. Um, I'm sure you know the XKCD comic. Um, so it's going to be yet another way of doing text formatting. But this time, of course, it's going to be the really best way to do it. All right. So what's text formatting? Pretty easy. Uh, you, as an input, you have components of text. You have some order of these components. And then some for these components, some parameters, how to turn these components into text. And then you put it all together. And as an output, you get a string. Easy enough. How can we do that? Well, I think there are fundamentally two ways to do it. One is we use a format string. A format string is essentially a string with some placeholders in there, and these placeholders are then replaced by the components, and they also contain the way how to format that particular component. And by examples are we got printf, we got the upside library from Google, and also, we got vo just voted freshly into the standard uh, the std format tool from in the now in C++20. It uses kind of a Python syntax. The other way to do it um, is what I would call just C++. You use the existing C++ facilities, uh, functions, parameters, um, overloaded operators. One of them is the I.O. streams. Everyone hates them. But uh, this was the way how we did text formatting before we had std format, if you want to stick to the standard. Um, Another way, of course, is simple string concatenation. You just take the strings and put them all together. Now, let's go through them one by one and see why we would choose either one. Um, so why would you choose format strings? I think format strings, you may say, has the advantage that um, you see more what you get. You already have a string, you have some placeholders. If you squint your eyes and you imagine the replacement of the components, you kind of can see how that string will eventually look like you are closer to the eventual output. Um, you have also the advantage that maybe you can decide that format string at runtime rather than at compile time, which is difficult if you have a C++ construct. Um, in, in modern C++, it is either already possible or it will be possible, depending on the library, to do compile time checks on that, standard, on that, format, uh, on that format string. Of course, you're going to forego that when you do runtime uh, format strings. Now, why wouldn't you use format strings? Well, first of all, you have to remem remember to escape a format string. Some symbols invariably will going to have some special semantics in your, in your string, and you have to watch out when you actually use a string that you are going to escape these strings before you use it as, an, as a format string. OK. Um, there's another thing which I don't like, is that you are essentially inventing an extra language for your parameters. We already have a language. That's C++. Now, you're going to invent another language on top of that, inside that format string, how to describe the parameters. Hmm. That's maybe a bit clumsy, philosophically, but more practically, whenever you have a user-defined format for a component that you yourself wrote that you want to insert into a string, you have to supply a little parser that turns the format, the, the, the description of the format, into what in, into your, your, your logic that you want to when you, when you generate the string. So you kind of have to ship a parser, which may, people, may keep people from actually adding user-defined components. And, and in our code, we have these a lot. Um, here's another thing that I don't like. Um, there is no gradual change in syntax when you go from plain vanilla concatenation, so you have string, 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 to something that, that inserts something that needs to be formatted into the string. So strings, you would probably naively expect to concatenate via plus operator. You just chain them together. Now, you probably wouldn't write a std format for it. But now, when you want to insert a number in between, you suddenly have to switch to std format. So maybe people will be tempted to say, OK, I'm going to do a mixture of the two. I'm going to write string plus std format just to, imp to, to insert my, uh, my number, and then I'm just keep concatenating strings again. So, so there's no real canonical way to express these things. Um, there's one area where you need format strings, absolutely, uh, which is translation. 
Usually when you translate your code, you're not going to do it all in-house. Maybe you have your Spanish-speaking developer, but maybe he has other things to do rather than translate your program. So you're going to ship this to an agency, to an outside agency, and you need to somehow communicate with them. And, and typically you communicate using some interchange format. Some, it's XLIF is the XML uh, standard to exchange translation data. And there, of course, you may have strings that contain placeholders that have to insert something somewhere. So this has to go back and forth between the translation agency and, and the, the software development. So, um, and there you need placeholders and thus format strings. But I would argue, don't give these st format strings too much power. You are exchanging information with an outside agency. You don't want them to control things like which decimal, digit to, uh, decimal separator to use, the point or, or the comma, or the number of decimal places. This does not depend on the string. It depends on what you want to format. So if you are formatting yen, you don't want any, any uh, decimal places. If you are formatting euros, you want to have two decimal di uh, digits. But this is not going to be decided by the, by, the, by the translator. This is going to be decided by the logic of your program. Same with date formats. When you have, usually when you express dates in your program, we usually go with whatever the user is used to in, its, in, in the operating system environment. So if you have somewhere from the operating system, you get whatever he wants to see as his standard date format, use it because that's what he's going to be used to. That's what he's going to see in the file explorer, for example, and that's the format you want to use. And that's not to be decided by the translation agency again. So just give them the power they need, and they certainly need positional arguments. They need to be able to swap things around and insert places, uh, uh, components into places, but that's pretty much all they need. And we've translated all our program, never ran into anything else. Now, let's look at the other option, just C++. Um, the first thing is I.O. streams. I put them there, they're in the standard, they're awful. Everyone hates them. I mean, they abuse operator overloading, which is excusable. They did not have variadic templates, so okay. Um, they are also stateful. You have to insert these state change changes into the, into the stream, um, and they are, they are either influencing only the th next thing you are going to insert into the stream or all of the following ones, so you have to remember. So whenever you pass this thing around your program, very likely at some point this thing is going to have the wrong state. And you have to be very disciplined about keeping it in a state or you have to reset the state all the time, which is, is wasteful. Um, Overall, not terribly practical. They are also not known for blazing speed. So um, they have a lot of virtual calls because there is this virtual hierarchy of you have an I/O buffer at the, uh, at the bottom, and then you you, you stack uh, your your actual formatting stuff on top. And they communicate with the other, other um, through virtual calls. This was basically designed before the advent of, of the standard library of, of, of templating. Um, you also have extra copies because you first put this whole thing together in an I.O. buffer and then if you want to have it in a string, you do an extra copy. So not great overall. There was another option, string concatenation. And um, here, of course, you say, oh, well, that's very raw, right? So we again have a different abuse of operator overloading. You Use the plus instead the sh of the shift operator, um, and you have no formatting options to speak uh, to to to, um, to to use. So you got you got this two string, which is a very bare bone way to turn a number into a string, which is part of the standard. Rarely used, we pretty much never use it. Um, it is again slow because you got a lot of temporaries. So these these temporaries, they they every string you generate generates a temporary string, and you you put them together and it generates another temporary. So it's not terribly efficient. Um, so, but I like it. Why do I like it? Because it's conceptually the essence of formatting. You use, you have a component of text that you can transform using some function. A function is a basic thing that's built into C++. So you take some value, you pump it through your function, you spit out a string, which is how you want that, that, that piece of data to be formatted, and then you concatenate everything. From the, from the syntax, from, from how it's being used, it's nice. It just doesn't work very well. Now, this talk is going to be about overcoming the weaknesses of that approach using ranges. Because in the, in the C++ 20 standard, there are now ranges voted in, and there is std format voted in, but these two come really from two different strains of development. They, they are not joined yet, right? 
So this is basically an approach of, if we have ranges, how can we do the, the, the text formatting well? All right. First of all, let's talk about ranges. Who knows the range-based for loop? Hands up. C++ 20 ranges. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Who knows Eric Niebler's library? Okay, that, that's pretty much the C++ 20 ranges. Who uses already ranges in code? Any one of them. Who uses them all the time? You should all use them. Use them. They make your code so much better. Really. If, you have, if you're working in a company that doesn't use ranges, you are wasting, f we are wasting productivity. It's bad. We use them in, in, everywhere. I'm going to talk about it. Okay. Now, what's the essence of ranges? Essentially, anything with a begin and an end is a range. So instead of writing something like std find it begin it end with something, um, Yugi is going to mention that it begin and it end as, as, as one object, as, as a range. And that range will then be queried for begin and end in, in, a, in the easy case. Now, ranges could either be containers, you can plug in a vector or you can plug in a string, or the, the range library provides objects that lump together just these two iterators. They are just referencing the elements. They're not owning them, just like iterators before, just a reference, but now together in one object. And these things you can pass around and pass to algorithms such as, such, such as find. Now, um, the interesting thing about ranges is they may actually do lazy calculations. So if in the C++ 20 uh, syntax you write something like this, then the, nothing will actually happen. So the range, you, you write range gets filtered, so a filter, you, it's only certain elements of that range will get taken, but, but this will not happen at the time when you write that expression. It will just capture the range, and capture the expression, and when it comes to iterating over that construct, that new range that has been formed, it will actually do the actual filtering. So it will just perform, the, do the call to the predicate, and pick out the elements that you, that you want. Now, why do I think I know something about ranges? ThinkCell has a homegrown range library. We've been growing it out of boost range. We've been using it for 15 years right now. Um, they're a little bit more powerful than std ranges, I think. Um, we have about a million lines of production code that uses these ranges. Um, and usually you have that chicken and egg problem, right? Because when you are, when you are designing a, a library, you don't have any usage. You will only get a good library when you have a lot of usage. But once you have a lot of usage, you cannot change the library anymore because then everyone's going to scream that you broke their code. And we solved this problem um, by having someone... For, first of all, all the code is in-house, right? We have control over who uses the library and the library. And we have people who actually do nothing else but refactoring the code when we do a change to the library. So we were free to change the library as often as we wanted to tune it and to, to make it nicer every time. And I think we learned a lot about how a good library should look like, and part of that library are the ranges. Now, if you move from your, your text processing to ranges, what are the things you should do first? Well, I mean, all these member functions that you right now use on basic string, in my opinion, have to go. You're not going to use these member functions anymore because a string is just a range, and the range can all be run, operated on with the same generic algorithm. So we're going to use ranges find instead of the dot find. That makes you flexible with string types. You don't, are not relying on co like, like converting everything into basic string anymore. You can just take any, I, any operating system string, and, and many operating systems have their favorite string types, and you can just wrap them into an, in a range interface and, and use them. So that makes you, it removes these, these translation steps. Um, everything, everything becomes uniform. Now, unfortunately, C17 decided, well, the, the basic string is really kind of a little bit obsolete with, its, with all its member functions, but we're going to add yet another type that offers exactly these same member functions. Um, of course, it's meant to be compatible with basic string, so it's a drop and replacement, and that was the need for that basic string view. And, and I understand that. Nevertheless, I would recommend a new code, don't use it, use ranges. Now, all these range libraries um, 
actually, except for the C++ 20, I couldn't find it in there, but Eric Niebler's library certainly has it, Boost, uh, Boost Range has it, um, have, have range concatenation. So we can, what we do want to do for text formatting, we can pick, range, pick strings and, and concatenate them. And this is now the, this is uh, how it's expressed in our library, um, but there are similar syntax in range v3. Now, okay, now we want to insert other components that need to be formatted. Well, that's easy. We just have a function like sdeck that turns our number that we want to format into a um, into into a, into a, it's something that resembles a string, and we're going to give it the format the, the the format description the the parameters that it needs. For example, we want two decimal digits. Okay. Now, remember, this is not like I/O stream. In I/O stream, you put in the values directly. You just say, okay, this is the double. I'm going to stream that double into my my stream. That's not how it works here because the double is not a string. Conceptually, this S deck, what's coming out of S deck, is a string. So, so you have to write that as deck. That, but that also keeps everything clear in your mind, like what kind of types are you, or concepts are you, are you putting together. Um, there's no need for a special format function. You are never really explicitly saying, now I'm formatting data. You're just concatenating ranges. And, um, and just some of these ranges happen to be the result of some sort of formatting function. Um, it's very easy to extend it for the user. You simply uh, put together another function that returns a string, and, um, and then that you can actually use in your concatenation. So, so that's, that's very simple. You don't need to write any parsers, any, anything that, that fulfills a certain protocol. You just write a C++ function, done. Now, all the range algorithms work. So you can use a for each on things that contain an SDEC. It will spit out. The, the characters that, that result from the formatting. You can use all of any of any algorithms that you come up with, you can actually use uh, together with something that, that has been formatted. Now, eventually, you would want to put this stuff into a container, like a std string. How do you do that? Well, in my opinion, string already gives us an empty construction, and it also gives you a construction from, from a literal or another string. Why can't you just add a constructor from a range? Easy enough, right? Semantics are pretty clear. Um, now, since it's also, you, you, you have to, if you have multiple of these ranges, you have to write concat. You have to concatenate them first and then put them into the string. Well, in our library, you can just omit that. You can just say, okay, this is a string, and you would just have multiple arguments, and all these things are concatenated uh, and put into the string. Now. What about the existing constructors of std string? I mean, I'm, I'm saying I mean, you can have like, a, 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 like more than one argument to std string. What about these, these constructors? What do we do with them? Let's look at them. All well, these are constructors here of std string. Oh my God. So this takes three elements of the A buffer. Well, it only has two elements, A and the zero term. That's, that's undefined behavior. Hmm. Okay, well, let's try that again. Okay. Okay, so this is adds, ah, yeah. the, as you can clearly see, this adds 65 times a control C to your string. Every, everyone sees that, right? Yeah, clear, right? Yeah, okay, so, and, and the last one actually adds three times the A. So, I mean, <laughs> deprecate that stuff. You don't, you don't need it. <laughs> this, is, this is useless, okay? Write it clearly. Generate a range that is clearly three times an A. And then we just make a string out of it. You just, it's very much more descriptive, and, and I don't know what you need the other constructors for. Now, um, of course, we are not the power of the standard committee. Okay? We can't change constructors, and we still use the std string. So what, did we do? what we did is in the library, we have this explicit cast facility, which ex expresses essentially all the constructors that we would like to have but that we cannot add to the existing types. So, so explicit cast is our way of, of adding constructors. And there, all the stuff that I showed you works. Um, there is also uh, a wrapper for mplace spec, because mplace spec, of course, internally calls a constructor. So you need to do some magic in order for us to, for this replacement constructors to work. So um, you can write something like this now in the library. You have a, a vector of strings, 
and you can just simply m place back an as dect, and, and it will get automatically converted into the string and add it to the vector. Now, there's also an append. Uh, again, variadic uh, parameters are allowed. They're automatically concatenated. And uh, finally, I also told you that there must be a way to, form that to, to do format strings. Uh, and there is a TC placeholders, um, which, again, only allows positional arguments. All the formatting stuff goes in the back when you, where you describe the snippets. You have this as deck here again. Uh, you can also use named arguments if you want. Sometimes it's easier to read, easier to, um, to deal with. In particular, if the format strings are not written by programmers, but maybe are edited by people who are not as familiar with programming. And, and you can see also here that these placeholders are freely mixed with, with other things. So you, you, you HTML escape the result of that placeholder call, and then you concatenate extra, extra strings onto them. And this is quite typical code. This is this, like, like sometimes you have like this long piece of code which basically describes a half of a website uh, or web page, um, all being basically one big string, which doesn't only gets instantiated once it's all being put together. Now, of course, naively, you could implement it like this. Each one of the formatters returns a std string, and the concat returns a string, and the appender just appends strings. You could do that. Now, of course, that would be horribly inefficient. Um, it would be simple, but it would be inefficient, and also I wouldn't have anything more to talk about. So let's skip that, um, and let's see how we can actually implement all that stuff efficiently. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we don't want to do all these heap allocations. We don't want to allocate all these temporaries. Um, and that will work by, by the formatters being lazy. They will just generate the character sequence while we are iterating. And then these as deck or, or, or dollars uh, 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 formatter is actually just a small object on the stack. It will just capture the, what you want to format, the F, and, what, and, and how you want to format it. And so the SDAC will just store these two, these two F and two parameters. And then the concat, again, will also just store um, all these components which, you are which are given to it. To avoid problems with lifetime, things which are passed in as an R value are going to be kept captured by value. Things that you pass by L value are captured by reference. In practice, this works very well to avoid uh, lifetime problems. And it, it happens all under the hood. You don't have to, to worry about it. It's a bit like expression templates. You build this big tree of, uh, of, of how the string is being put together. And when it comes to actually generating the string, you evaluate that, that expression tree. Um, now, in order to do the formatting into a container fast, uh, you only want to allocate memory once. So you first determine the string length. Then you allocate all the memory and then you fill in the characters. OK, let's try that. Uh, that's the first attempt to do that. You have a container, and you pass it begin and end. And that should, in the old C++20 world where this constructor exists, from constructing a, a string from two iterators, it should actually construct the string. Except the problem is your formatters in, all gen in, in general are not going to be random access. So you won't be able to tell how large the complete string is. So what the string actually is doing is it's first iterating once through a whole string to measure the length. And then it's allocating the memory, and then it's iterating again to fill in the string. That's rather inefficient. And we can do better. So what if your range exposes a size member? You could use that size member to pre-allocate your container. So you, you, you check, do you have size? Yep, I have size. OK, I'm going to call your size, then I know how big you are, and then I'm going to allocate the memory, and then actually do the iteration. OK, that's better. Um, now, we also have append, right? And it must work the same way. Also there, we want to avoid allocations. Um, so um, we have this implementation. So before we do append, we call the, uh, the std size on the range. And then we call the size or the current size of the container. We add the two, and then we reserve the memory. This is terrible. Who sees the problem? Okay, reserve is evil. 
reserve reserves just enough memory to fit what you pass to it. If you pass to your append a snippet and a snippet and yet another snippet and yet another snippet, not in a single append, but one by one in a loop, for example, then every time you call your append, you're going to reallocate your string and copy it over and reallocate and copy it over. It's going to be horribly inefficient. So we have to write our better reserve. So that, that's how it looks like. It basically checks, do we have enough capacity? If you don't have enough capacity, make sure that when you enlarge the capacity, you enlarge by some constant factor, like the golden ratio, for example, is a popular one. So you basically do what m place or, 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 uh, or pushback is doing. They are they're always enlarging by, by some constant factor, and, and the reserve has to do the same thing um, in order to stay efficient for these use cases. And then we drop it into the append, then it will work. Okay, next bottleneck, iterators. What's the problem about iterators? Let's look at the iterators of concat. We use concat a lot here, right? So we always concat our, concatenate our, um, our, our components. So we want to make the, the concatenation efficient. Now, when you are incrementing an iterator, what's an iterator of a concat? The iterator is essentially a variant of all the components, because the iterator could either be in the first component, and then it must be an iterator to the first component, or it could be in the second component, must be an iterator of the second component, and so on. So you have a variant of iterators. And each time you are incrementing the iterator, you have to branch on the type of iterator you currently have. If you are in the first one, you have to increment the first iterator. If you have the second one, you have to increment the second iterator, and so on. And you do this each and every time you go from one, from one character to the next. That's not terribly efficient. So, what's the problem and how do we overcome it? Uh, ASDEC has the same problem, right? Because ASDEC will also have to do some bookkeeping while you are, you are enumerating the characters to, to convert your integer or your floating point to, uh, to actual characters. Um, you have to, you, 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 this is not a random access operation. You, you need to keep track of, of state. And uh, if you have to restore that state every time your iterator is called, it's kind of costly. C++ iterators do external iteration. What is that? So essentially, the consumer of what you, the, the consumer of, of, of your, your data is sitting at the bottom of the stack. It, it's running along. And every time it needs some data, it'll call the producer and say, hey, star it, plus plus it, give me data. And it'll, it'll, it'll just do that as long as you have still data to, to produce. Now. If the consumer is at the bottom of the stack and the producer is at the top of the stack, the, the, to be at the bottom of the stack is always nice because you have a contiguous code path. You can write one program that goes through your whole input, or your whole output rather, and, and process it. While the producer gets called only for, for each item and it only has a contiguous code path for each item. And before it produces the next item, it needs to kind of restore its state. It doesn't, it doesn't have the state naturally stored in the instruction pointer. And that makes iterators harder to write than, than, a, than, a, than, a, than a, if you are at the bottom of the stack, some visitor pattern. So try traversing a tree, for example, as an iterator versus traversing the tree in a recursive manner as a visitor pattern. The visitor pattern is just going to be much easier and faster. They also don't have all the memory they may need. So if you have an iterator, all you can store from one, one item to the next item, you have to store inside the iterator, or you have to store a pointer to some heap object in the iterator. While usually when you, are, when you store a, uh, um, when, when, you, when you are at the bottom of the stack, you can store everything on the, on the stack. Your stack is going to live as long as you want to. Now, text formatting is actually more efficient with internal iteration. Internal iteration just turns the roles around. You have the producer sitting at the bottom of the stack and the consumer at the top of the stack. So essentially how this works is, and this is, if you look at the implementation of std format, that's the, the, the standard std format, um, that's how it's implemented. So there is, a, there is an algorithm running, and every time he comes up with a new character, you'll just say, oh, I have a new character. Here, consumer, take it. And the consumer does nothing, does something pretty stupid. It just adds it usually to, to a container. So that's pretty simple. That can be written quite efficiently on the top of the stack. 
while the more complicated algorithm, which is the formatting, runs at the bottom of the stack. And this is actually how you want to do text formatting. Now, it is great that many of the range algorithms actually run just fine with internal iteration. So binary search and find, if you're dealing in iterators, don't work because you don't have iterators for, with internal iteration. But um, many of the other algorithms can be implemented for each, accumulate, all of, any of, none of. Also the adapters, uh, like what we had, the filter, and there's also a transform. They can also be implemented using internal iteration. So um, it's, it's quite, it's quite uh, uh, attractive to extend ranges to support internal iteration. How do we do that? Well, um, the way we do it, the, 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 the syntax we come up with is uh, we just simply use the function call operator. So whenever you have an object that has a function call operator that takes a f another functor as the sync, it can just put its elements into the sync. So, so this, is, this for each here shows how it works. So you have the first, the range, which gets a sync, and it calls the sync with one and with two. And then you have the visitor, which consumes the one and the two. And it's, it, really, it, it is really simple. The, the for each has a pretty much a trivial implementation. Um, it can't really, it, the, the for each as we wrote it, tests whether it can do this internal iteration. If it cannot do it, then it falls back to iterators. So there is, uh, there's a little bit of logic in there. But other than that, it's pretty trivial. Now, the concat, if you write it with internal iteration, that was our example that was not very high performing in, uh, to begin with when we used iterators, is actually very simple with internal iteration. All you're doing is you iterate first over all the ranges you have. And for each one of the ranges, you iterate in turn and, and enumerate its elements. So you really just have this nested loop, which it makes th that, and that's the implementation of a concat with internal iteration. And that's very efficient. You, you, that's like, like, the ha like you would handwrite such things. You can, you can simply, well, you would just write individual loops basically for each range. Um, so how do we use that for text formatting? In order to put things into a container, um, we have a customization point, which is called an appender, which is a sync that appends stuff to the container. So um, the, this, this customization point is found somehow. There's a standard, a, a default implementation, but also containers are free to define their own ones if they want to. The standard implementation is a simply a, a, an end place back. So when every time you, you call the, the, uh, the sync with a character, it will just end place back to the container. Easy enough. Now, what about the reserve? We said it's kind of important to avoid allocations. Hmm. So we added another customization point, which is we call chunk. Essentially, what chunk does is before the for each starts sticking things into the sync, it asks the sync first, um, do you want the whole range? Do you want everything in one go? I'll just give it to you, everything. You have to deal with it. And it does that compile time check. Can I call you with the whole range? If yes, it'll just call chunk and not do anything any, any, anymore. And then what a reserving appender can do is can say, OK, please give me the whole range. And like, OK, I get the whole range. I ask it for the size do the reserve, and then recursively call for each, because then by then I know, okay, I, I did, my, did my reserving, and then it will, it will just run through the regular appending algorithm by recursively calling for each. So that's, that's how that is implemented. Now, you would think, well, maybe this chunk thing is kind of like a, a special purpose, a one-trick pony, right? It just, you had this reserve problem, and you had to somehow overcome it, so, hmm, you, you just added some, some customization point. At the end, you end up with a gazillion customization points that only serve a single purpose. Well, not quite. Um, if you, for example, have something that appends to a file, typically what you can do with a file is if everything is in one memory chunk, you can write it with one call to the file. Now, this is what, what actually this file appender is doing. You can see the chunk actually takes a stit span as a parameter. So the compile time check will say, OK, this range, does this convert to a std span? If it does, then it's a contiguous piece of memory. 
and then I can actually give, like, write it in one go. If that doesn't work, then I'll say, well, okay, then I'll just go operator uh, parentheses and pass the, uh, the elements in one by one, and they get written one by one. So here, in a, in a very different context than, than allocating memory, you also gain efficiency through this chunk um, customization point. Now, of course, uh, I'm always talking about performance, and it wouldn't be fair if I would leave you without some, some benchmarks of how this actually works. Um, as a as a straw man task, I have a simple formatter, and I'm, I'm deliberately keeping this formatter very simple. Uh, it's just writing some, some, some characters, three of them, and you can specify all, how often you want to write each one of them. So in this case, we will write 10 times an A, 10 times a B, 10 times a C. And the algorithm, if you just write it in a, in a handwritten way, will just be loops, just loops filling a buffer. You just loop through it n times, and you just, you just fill the buffer. Uh, with, with three different loops. Now, here is the whole thing written. This, is, this was the handwritten loop. There you have, there you have the, hand, the handwritten code. And this is the whole thing with our infrastructure. You have um, an append with three times repeat n. And the buffer in each, in each case is, is very, very simple. It's simply a static piece of memory. I, without any memory allocation, I know I'm not going to overrun the buffer. I allocate enough memory and just write out the characters. Once going through the whole infrastructure, and once just writing simple loops, just adding the characters. So what do we get? Actually, if you have an iterator-based repeat n, then you're going to have a 50% overhead over the handwritten loop. If you have internal iteration, it goes down to about 15% overhead over the handwritten code, both in Visual Studio, a recent, a recent version of uh, Visual C++. Um, and this test is the worst case, because the, the, format, the formatting work that's done is very trivial. You, you don't do any work. You, if you spend computation time in your actual format of figuring out which, uh, how to, uh, which characters to output for integers, for example, this is going to, the number's going to be, come out better. Um, so that we are pretty good, 15% away from the best possible code. Um, let's see whether we can get even better. Um, so let's say we have a toy basic string implementation. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, to, to change basic string around to be more efficient. Um, the, my toy basic string implementation just has three heap pointers, uh, the three, three pointers to the heap, so there's a begin, an end, and the end of the buffer. Um, again, we have the same formatting task, and, and again, written with our infrastructure, okay? Now, our standard appender does this. It um, reserves, and then it does an mplace back repeatedly. Now, the problem is with the mplace back, each time you, you insert a character, you have to make sure that you don't overrun your buffer because, of course, you, you, you don't know how much memory there is, right? The, the, the appender, the reserving appender knows because it actually did the reserve. But once the appender is called and you are inside the, where, where in place back is called, you don't know anymore. Okay? So um, what if we change that? What if we improve the, uh, the appender by, uh, uh, by using the fact that we know that we actually allocated all the memory? So you, you, you allocate the memory for your string, and afterwards, you know that the size is going to be large enough. You don't do have to do the end check anymore. You can just write characters one by one. And that's, that's what we did here. And it turns out, although the string was only 30 characters long, and we actually included the heap allocation, we, every time we did a heap allocation, the customer pander actually saves 20% of time. It's surprising that, that er, the heap allocation is not even that costly. Heaps are, are relatively efficient, and apparently this end check is actually relevant. Um, of course, we would need our own basic string implementation, which we haven't done yet, uh, but it's certainly an attractive thing to do. Now, here's more things you could do with, uh, 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 with respect to the performance. Um, you maybe don't, not all your snippets can pre-compute their size, possibly. Maybe you're too lazy to write it, whatever. But maybe you can at least give it a minimum size. A typical situation where this would be the case if you, if you um, re-encode Unicode. So you have a UTF-16 string, you turn it into UTF-8. Now, the UTF-8 string is going to have at least as many characters as the UTF-16 string. 
maybe more if you need to you know, use the, the, the higher level UTF-8 uh, characters, um, but at least as many. So you can write a min size that says, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I need that much. And, uh, and then the concat could go and, and calculate what it l the, the least amount of memory you need and pre-allocate that. When you go over, then you have to pre-allocate, you have to allocate again, but maybe only once, not n times when you, as if you uh, would start basically with an empty string. Now, um, there may be also another use case where you have a file buffer. So you have a file, you write, want to write into the file, um, and you know the, the, the file buffer is 4K large, you know you how much you have in that buffer. If my string could tell me, I'm, I'm going to be at a maximum, I'm going to be 3K long, again, I can omit any end check. I can just say, OK, you're, you promised me that you're not going to overrun my buffer. I'm just going to give you the buffer, just fill it. No problem. Um, and, and you could do this either as you have size or you could have a max size a customization point, yet another customization point. I heard like in D or so that, um, is it D or Rust, that they actually have an interval. That some of the ranges can give you an interval, like a minimum and a maximum. Anyway, um, that gets me to the end of my talk. Um, I showed you how to use the range syntax and the algorithms for text formatting. Um, for performance, we need a few more customization points, but if we actually add them, we become competitive with handwritten code. The whole ThingCell library is public. It's also under a boost license, so you can freely use it. Uh, you can take a look at it. And if you want to work on that library, uh, we're always hiring, so you can you have a booth outside. You can go there um, and uh, help us out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arno, and we have time for a couple of questions. No question? Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, you mentioned that your library is even better than stood ranges. Uh, in which particular aspect is this the case, and uh, what efforts are you doing in order to make your stuff into stood ranges? Okay, as I end, I, I, I start with the end of the of the question. Uh, none. Um, we we actually use it as an in-house library, um, and it's public. Uh, we haven't put the effort in to um, use. To, 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 to standardize it. We are trying here and there to influence uh, how C++20 uh, or how the ranges evolve. Uh, there was one particular case where we, actually, where we actually influenced it in a quite critical way to avoid pessimization of the, of the ranges. Uh, so I'm kind of keeping a side look on what, what's happening there. Um, but we don't have a standard proposal for it. Now, how are they better? Um, I think there are probably two real fundamental ways. Um, one is the internal iteration. That's not, that's not part of the, of the standardization. Um, could be added. Um, the other part is how we, and I mentioned it in the talk, is how we deal with R values. Um, we always aggregate R values into our, our filters or our adapters. So whenever you are, you are passing in um, a, uh, you, you, when, you are, when you are putting together multiple ranges or you ad adapt an existing range, you always have an option to pass this in as an R value and it will then get aggregated. Um, in, in the, in the uh, standard library, for example, there's, there, there's this scenario that's going to be problematic. If you have a function that generates an R value vector, you just generate a local vector, and you want to return a lazy transformation of that vector, you basically have two things to return. You have to return your vector, and you have to somehow return a, referen a, 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 a transform that references vector. And that, 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 that reference is going to be dangling because you are, you are losing your, your local copy of your vector you, when you return it. It goes out of scope. And, and I don't see really a good way to handle that in the, in the C++ 20 ranges right now. And, and, and this, was, this was a problem that we encountered very early on when we actually kept using ranges. Uh, it, it's, it's nothing new to, to the, the C++ 20. It's, it's something that, that also happened with up for us. And, and then we said, OK, we have to solve it somehow. And, and the, the idea of aggregating also is not from us. I think it's, I heard it once from Google. But um, 
it, it's, it solves the problem. And I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a critical design um, choice that, that makes it more usable. Any other question? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very nice. Uh, I have a question. Did you do any kind of benchmarks on uh, how much time did it uh, take to compile? Because if you are taking all those, oh, okay. No, we didn't. No, we didn't yet. Um, it, it, our our library is. Um, it is very much a work in progress uh, and has been for years and years. So um, once in a while we run into uh, compilation time problems. Um, it, it, is, that, that's, it is a constant problem. Um, the, 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 so far the problems were elsewhere. So for example, uh, what's really bad is if you generate overloads at the top level namespace. And every time you do a plus, for example, the compiler has to check, well, is that, is that the plus that you, that you instantiate? Like, is, is that the plus that you, that you wrote there? Um, these kind of things took enormous amounts of time. We had to take them out. Um, but I, I can't tell you exactly about the compilation times. No, sorry. Thank you. Any other question? OK, so thank you very much. Thank you.